Hey guys, it's Luciano Saber with Aspiring Hollywood and yet another phenomenal guest today. You guys have to stick around to meet Harry Doc Plore. Harry, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Tell me about your nickname. Uh, well, I got the nickname Doc uh, while uh, working as a freelance writer at Star Trek Voyager uh, because uh, I have a couple PhDs. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to find out about the PA. That's, that's why I asked the question. I want to Obviously. find out. Yes. What? So one in physics and one in chemistry. Great. And how, how does that work, combining uh, physics and chemistry with filmmaking? Well, it's a Leonardo uh, da Vinci approach to life, which is, you know, Leonardo was one of the greatest scientists and inventors of all times and one of the greatest artists of all times. So I followed that kind of life path is, is doing both uh, right brain, left brain, and, and to me, science is art, and, and uh, so it's, they're all art, it all has to do with creativity, and uh, so that's how they come together for me. Absolutely, and, and you're, you're a phenomenal filmmaker and, and film director and producer. Well, I, I don't know about the word phenomenal, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have done all of those things. I can vouch for him, guys. Come on, you know, you, you don't have to be modest here at Aspiring Hollywood. <laughs> oh, okay. No, yeah, I'm just the best. Uh, anyway, that, that, that's great. But tell me about your latest project. My latest project, I've got a couple, but the one that's exciting me the most right now is uh, Have Spacesuit Will Travel, which is based on uh, Robert Heinlein's uh, young adult novel. It's uh, his most popular uh, YA novel uh, dealing with a boy who uh, wants to go to the moon and uh, he enters a contest and loses it and wins a spacesuit. And through that spacesuit, he ends up going on a grand adventure uh, where he m makes first contact with aliens. And in, I guess in short, I would say it's, uh, it's the equivalent of Harry Potter in outer space. So where as Harry enters a world of magic and uh, magical creatures, uh, Kip enters a world of, uh, of advanced uh, civilizations and aliens and alien creatures. Well, that sounds, uh, sounds very interesting. Now, you also have another one that's, that's in distribution right now. Or, or yeah, so, so my current film that I have completed uh, is uh, Quantum Quest. And uh, Quantum Quest was a passion project for me because it mixed my science career and my entertainment career and kind of meshed them together, wove them together into one. It's not an edutainment. What it is is it's an entertaining piece that as you follow it, uh, you uh, become educated about a variety of science concepts as well as you get exposed to 20 years of major space discoveries through NASA. So we interweaved about um, somewhere between four and five billion dollars worth of science NASA data. Oh, wow. So I'll give you an example. So in the film, we could have spent pennies uh, creating uh, certain services of Venus and Mercury and Mars and the moons of Jupiter. Um, it would have been easy just to fake those, those surfaces. But instead what we did is we painstakingly used the NASA data to recreate in the same way, say, if you were doing a recreation of the White House or a recreation of the Grand Canyon, but you wanted to get every gully. So we did that. So when you see the surface of, say, the spider craters on Mercury. That is the spider craters, and you get to see them in 3D. Wow. So in essence, I take the audience, though ever so briefly, and let them tour the solar system for the first time. So, you know, instead of it being words, Venus becomes a place, Mars becomes a place, Mercury becomes a place. Now, they've already done it on Mars, but they haven't done it on the other planets. Wow. And the movie ends uh, with a grand tour of the moon of Titan. Okay. which, because our major, we started this off as a Cassini-Huygens promotional, you know, project in terms of promoting the Cassini-Huygens three and a half billion dollars uh, uh, exploratory mission of, of the Saturn system and its moons. And Titan was a big one. They dropped something called the Huygens probe down into Titan. So in essence, in the reason I'm leading here is it is a filmmaking thing. So if I took a camera package with lenses uh, recording system and audio that could transmit up to, say, a hard drive, and I threw it into the Grand Canyon and followed it down until it landed, that would be a camera package. Well, NASA did that, but for about a one and a half billion dollars. Wow. They dropped the Huygens probe, and it was maybe, uh, I forget it, maybe a 20 minute descent on a parachute, and it spun the whole time taking photographs and taking sound measurements. Um, 
So it was interesting for science, but how do you get that into the public? So this film basically does that, but in a very fantastic way. That is, that is just phenomenal. And I want to take a look at a couple of clips, if that's okay with you. Yeah. As, as, as we're, we're, we're talking, uh, take a look at these clips. But I mean, I also want to point out the fact that you have a phenomenal cast. And I, and I went to IMDb and I printed out this, this, uh, the, the cast list and it looks like you have Amanda Peet, you have Sam Jackson, uh, you have James Earl, the great James Earl Jones. I mean, how does a director get all these people in one movie? I mean, I know how the big budget movies get. Well, yeah, yeah. well that's the key. How do, how do you as a producer, writer, director, whatever, get a cast uh, without much money? So, and, um, and in this movie, it was very important. I, the, the story, I told you the, the hidden science behind this, but the story is, is an atomic adventure in outer space. So it's the smallest meets the biggest. And our characters, in the same way in, you know, you have uh, in the Ants movie, we've, we bring to life ants as, uh, as characters. In this movie, we bring fundamental science as characters. So photons and protons and neutrinos and, and electrons as characters as well as concepts, things that prevent you from studying like fear or ignorance or moronic. Um, and so in this movie, I wanted to follow this grand adventure instead of good, good versus evil. It's kind of like uh, life versus anti-life. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a different approach to good and evil. It's something that which is the void, which is to wipe out everything that existed from the Big Bang. Right. And then we have these other characters are here, like us, we're made of matter and energy. So, but in order to capture that, I wanted to get an all-star cast. And so uh, I went after to get all the actors that I thought would best draw in an audience, especially kids uh, and teenagers. So I started off with the concept of I'll go after two Captain Kirks, two Darth Vaders, and two Jedi Knights. Okay. So we did. We got Chris Pine and William Shatner. We got Sam Jackson and Mark Hamill, okay, and okay, but let me, Peyton let me, Christensen but, and, uh, and James Earl Jones. So but, how do you get them? Yes, that's because I'm it's very, up to very, that. very easy to say we got so-and-so, but how do you do that? Right, so okay. how do you do it okay. is you start with a good property, all right? And you start with your reputation. So you combine your reputation and a script. So I had written a script, and I have my reputation in the past as a filmmaker and uh, started reaching out personally to these people. And the reason that we had to personally reach out was because we could only afford to pay them SAG minimum. And everyone got the same amount. So no one, was, no one got better favored uh, status than other ones. So we went on something called Favored Nations. Right. You know, so we, everyone was equal. And uh, I personally reached out to each one of them. And some of them I knew oh. and, uh, from past projects. And many of them I didn't. Right. And it was a matter of perseverance. Right. And a big clue for those people who are just starting out, since this is what this is kind of about, make sure you subscribe to things like IMDb Pro. That will at least tell you, for instance, every actor's uh, representation. Okay. And their popularity as well. Yeah, but of course that star meter thing. I don't <laughs> give much credit to it because you can go from number one to number you know, like exactly, hundred thousand right. in, in sure. a month and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. come back. So uh, the way to do it was uh, I made contact with them. I had my reputation to help me, and then they liked the property. They would, uh, you know, it's all in negotiation. But at the end of the day, if um, I talked to somebody and I couldn't, they they wouldn't compromise. I just moved on. Tell me, tell me about the production and, and pre-production for a director. What's, what's that like? What, what do you need to do to prepare for your shoot? Well, on this project, which is very different than my live action projects, uh, pre-production uh, had involved uh, or did involve uh, um, character design, you know, lots more detailed storyboarding um, and uh, making sure to find the right talent. Because again, the budget that we were working on was far, far less than a normal uh, feature of this type. So uh, that involved also looking for talent and uh, so that, that we knew that we'd had the right people. Right. Now, now on a live action set, because that's what most, most of our audience members would start out doing, yep. right? With camera on the shoulder. And 
Do you have any, any advice for a, for a budding director? What's, what's the most important thing, in your opinion? Uh, I guess the most important thing for, for me as a director is to have a clear vision of what it is that you yourself want to show. And not to worry, you know, for instance, I, I, I leave a lot of stuff up to my DP in terms of how mm -hmm. to pull something off. But you should have a clear idea of, of how you want to tell a story. And if you can't, like I can't draw <laughs> with crap, so I can do some stick figure stuff. Right. Or I can get, but I can get a camera and I can, I can play with, around with it for angles. And okay. then I can print that off and I can give that to my storyboard artist. Or I can sit down with the storyboard artist and, and they'll go through. And then I'll look at it and say, no, that's not how I want, want to do this shot. Um, but you should get an idea of what it is. You shouldn't, I, I think preparation is important. Yeah. I think it's a, a good way to waste money and perhaps if you're a big, big director you can get away with it, but I think you should prepare yourself. You should know what it is you want to do. You should also have a good location scout, but you yourself, I myself like to, to go, you know, so once a location scout has found places, is to go myself and check them out and right. see what can be best used. And for instance, you know, uh, as a DP would tell you, lighting is important. So go to the place and see. If you're planning on shooting someplace, especially if you're a young director and you're starting off without much money, um, and so that means you're not going to have a lot of equipment, you're not going to be able to bring in and create day at night, exactly. you should go in and make sure that, you know, what the setting at the time that you want to shoot is going to look, what it's going to look like. Um, and uh, so I think the key word would be preparation. That's very good advice, guys, because, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of times uh, filmmakers are eager, you know, to, I just want to shoot something. I just want to go out there and grab the camera and shoot something. But preparation is so crucial. Like you said, people want to grab a camera. That's great. Leave your actors at home. Okay. Unless the actors are, <laughs> grab your camera first and go out and sh yeah. maybe, you know, film your locations and get a, bit, a little bit, if that's what you're feeling, then go back and prepare with them. But, I mean... Uh, a, I'm a big fan of Jerry Lewis, and not just because of his, what he does in front of the camera, but what he achieved behind the camera. And for instance, a lot of the things that we use today is because of Jerry Lewis, like video assist. Um, but I mean, he could write, produce, direct an entire film while doing stand-up comedy in about 60 days, and they would become a blockbuster hit. So it doesn't mean that you need to spend a giant amount, but he prepared. He was very prepared. L let me ask you this. We, as you're talking here, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, and we all have fears as, as filmmakers, right? We all have insecurities. Do you? You, you seem so confident. I have so, a lot of fears so, right now. <laughs> Do you really? <laughs> no. So, so, so tell me, what, what is Harry Docklore's biggest, biggest fear? Um, what is my biggest fear? I have no idea. I have to throw that question I have, in I have there. no idea what my, I don't, I, I guess I don't, I, I've, uh, I think my biggest fears have already come true, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to worry about them anymore. Okay. <laughs> I've pushed past them. Okay. So, I mean, you know, people worry about failing. I don't worry about failing uh, because you are going to fail. Uh, it's the important thing, is the cliche thing, but it's get yourself back up. And uh, so I don't really have fears when I, Make a, make a film. I have stress and I'll worry about, you know, so-and-so showing up to the set tomorrow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I guess no fear. And, and that's a very good uh, statement because, I mean, really filmmaking is just like life, you know, it's a journey, right? So it's not about your next success necessarily, you know, but it's about the, the experiences and, and the lesson learned. No, I completely agree. And, and in addition, I'd add to that is it is a journey and sometimes it can be a very long journey. And my last film took like three years because it was CGI, and then, then you're living with it because we're also marketing, distributing it right now, and uh, while we're in negotiations with some of the major studios. So if you work with people and you don't like them, it can be a very miserable journey. So try to work with people who you like. Um, but then on a business side, remember, it's a business. It's show business, it's not show fun. And so make sure you get contracts with everybody. I mean, here's the a mistake I think young filmmakers make all the time, which is, oh, you know, it's my buddies, we're going to do something, we have an understanding. No, you don't. You don't have an understanding unless you are a Siamese twin and your nervous system is connected, all right? So get a contract between your friends, get a contract between everybody, have clear understandings, 
because there's a lot of stress in filmmaking and uh, that's the best way to, to ruin your and, friendships and, is and, not have clarity. And especially if the movie's a success that it makes money at the box office, right? Yeah. Then, then the understandings go, go then, out. Then the there door. are no understandings. <laughs> then there's just what's on the paper. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for giving us the great advice, Harry. And, and uh, we hope to see you again. And we're going to follow you. And you guys follow Harry Doc Clore's career uh, on the internet and on the big screen. Uh, thank you for watching. And please visit us again at aspiringhollywood.com and our YouTube channel and our Facebook and all that social media stuff that I, I have no clue about, by the way. <laughs> but, but thank you again for watching. I'm Luciano Saber. Until next time.